I have been doing this a very long time, and I do my very best to not be a prisoner of the moment. I have seen the highs and the lows that come with covering an organization for a decade. The Memphis Grizzlies just won one of the most impressive regular season games I've seen them play since I started following this team back in 2011. And this was most certainly, in my opinion, the most impressive victory of the regular season against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Why? Let's talk about it. Lock in with me, folks. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Grizzlies. I am your host for this episode, Joe Mullinax, formerly of Grizzly Bear Blues over at SB Nation, now a writer for SB Nation NBA and fan cited. And I also, of course, of course, am the co-host of this wonderful podcast to Michael Cole. Not joining me on this episode. He's getting ready for a big West Coast trip along with the Grizzlies. So we'll see DeMichael here soon. Make sure you're subscribing, rating, reviewing wherever you get your podcasts. Locked On Grizzlies is a proud member of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, each and every day. Make sure that you're liking and commenting over on YouTube as well. So whether it's on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, make us here at Locked On Grizzlies a part of your NBA content, Memphis Grizzlies media consumption experience. This was the most impressive win for the Memphis Grizzlies this season over the Cleveland Cavaliers on Wednesday night. Let me say that again, be a little more clear in how I phrase it. In my opinion, the Memphis Grizzlies Wednesday night won their best game of the 2022-2023 season so far. Now you, dear listener, dear viewer, you are taking in this program and you're thinking to yourself, Joe, that's poppycock, that's preposterous. How dare you? The Grizzlies dominated the Milwaukee Bucks. They blew out the Phoenix Suns. They have all of these other games where they were competitive. They won. They've literally won 11 in a row. You're picking a game against the Cleveland Cavaliers on a Wednesday night where their best player, arguably, Evan Mobley looked pretty good to me, and so did Darius Garland, but arguably their best player, Donovan Mitchell, doesn't dress, doesn't play because of a groin injury. You're saying that that one-point victory for the Memphis Grizzlies was their best win of the season to this point? Yes, I am. And here's why. Because life is rarely ideal. Okay? I'm going to philosophize a little bit with you here on this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies. Life can be hard. Life can be difficult. And things will not always go the way that you want them to go. During this winning streak for the Memphis Grizzlies, things went well and have gone well a vast majority of the time. The right kinds of bounces. The right opportunities. Feeling good about themselves. The catching teams at the right time playing not-so-good basketball teams. Everything is lined up under the stars for Memphis to go on this run, and kudos to them for doing it. That was not the case on Wednesday night. The Cleveland Cavaliers, without Donovan Mitchell, came in and in a lot of ways outplayed the Memphis Grizzlies. The Cleveland Cavaliers, led by former Grizzlies head coach J.B. Bickerstaff, are a very good basketball team. They are going to be an issue in the Eastern Conference for whoever they see down the road. On Wednesday night, they were the issue of the Memphis Grizzlies. And they did it in a way that they're not usually accustomed to. Cleveland struggles with the three-point shot, much like Memphis does, at least in terms of their overall performance throughout the season. But that was not the case in this game. In this game, the Cleveland Cavaliers were in fuego, shall we say, from beyond the arc. They shoot 36% as a team, 16th in the NBA going into this game. They did a little bit better than that. This one, 45.7% from beyond the arc, 16 of 35, 16 of 35. So about 10 percentage points better than they normally shoot. From the field overall, similar situation. They were really impressive in terms of getting to the basket. They're really impressive in finishing at the rim. I mentioned Evan Mobley a moment ago, a really solid outing for him, 9 out of 15. Isaac Okoro made all four of his three-point attempts. Jared Allen was 6 of 9. 
Karis Levert looked like bubble Levert there for a little while. Nine of 19, 23 points. Darius Garland, again, an all-star caliber guard in the Eastern Conference. The bench of Cleveland is what has given them issues. But the starters, the five starters for the Cavaliers, looking at in-game plus minus, outplayed the Grizzlies starters. That is not ideal for Memphis to win a basketball game. But as you go through this journey that is an NBA season and you get into the postseason and you get into showdowns with teams that have comparable goals, that can play relatively similar styles of basketball, and you look across at that team and they're doing it a little bit better than you, but you're able to keep it close. What do you do in those adverse moments? How do you respond? How do you compete? And I think this was a major step for the Memphis Grizzlies in this particular contest. One person in particular that it was a major step for, Jaron Jackson Jr. His numbers are not going to jump out at you because he battled foul trouble. The, the narrative is a little bit tired in terms of him doing this constantly. He's fouled out once in the last 11 or so games. It's definitely not as prevalent as NBA media members at the national level that clearly don't watch the Grizzlies often, which there's a lot of teams in the NBA, in fairness to them. But they latch onto a narrative. Jaron has foul issues, and they hold on to it. Has not been as big of an issue this season, but it did rear its ugly head in this particular game. Jaron only averages about 30 minutes a game regardless of foul concerns. He played 28 against Cleveland, so it wasn't that big of a deal in this one either. But it was late. When he re-entered the game with five fouls in the fourth quarter, I'm going to be honest, dear listener, dear viewer, I had the, the, the rumblies in my tumbly. I had the butterflies flitter fluttering around. I was nervous if Jaron was going to be able to answer the call. I always have had faith in Jaron. Ever since good friend, former host of Lockdown Grizzlies, Peter Edmiston, convinced me all the way back in 2018 that Jaron was an excellent pick when I was a little more nervous about it. I trust in Peter, and I've retained that trust. I never sold my stock, but I, I knew the magnitude of the moment. It's just one regular season game, one win, one loss. I said on Twitter, regardless of the outcome, it was a major opportunity for Jaron Jackson Jr., and he rose to that moment because he showed development. He showed understanding, evolution of how he defends, verticality, not reaching, keeping his arms straight up, jumping straight up, making sure his body was back so he wasn't making contact on the hip or on the leg. He was able to finish the game. He was able to stay in and be the defensive presence that his team needs him to be in order for them to be successful. He's 23 years old, young basketball player, young in the NBA still, and he is still learning and growing both literally and figuratively. So to see him re-enter that game with all the juju and energy and all of the, the things creeping up in your mind, the doubt that can come with it, to be able to maintain against, again, Evan Mobley is one of the best young bigs in the NBA. Jared Allen is very good at what he does on the block and down low, finishing at the rim. Those are two very good young bigs. For him to be able to finish this game, to stay in a position where he could make his defensive impact, make things complicated, especially for guards like Darius Garland trying to get to the basket. If Jaron wasn't on the floor in the closing moments, would Dylan Brooks, who we're going to talk more about here in a moment, have been able to make that game-winning play? Blocking that shot. Maybe. But I also know if Jaron Jackson Jr. is not on the floor, it's a heck of a lot easier for Garland, who has some Kyrie Irving to his game, Quick little handle, quick little sidestep, get to the basket, try to draw a foul, finish it at the free throw line, or make a tough shot, hit a floater. All of those possibilities are much more probable if Jaron Jackson Jr. is on the bench. And there have been times in his career where he would have made the mistake. He would have made the costly foul. He wouldn't have been able in that moment to retain and understand the magnitude and keep his verticality, keep straight up. It sounds simple, sounds easy. It's not. Not even for the most veteran of players. When the game is on the line, your best players need to be on the floor. Availability is the greatest ability sometimes. Jaron Jackson Jr. took a major step 
against the Cleveland Cavaliers and showing just how well he understands that. We'll talk about the two veteran Grizzlies who helped seal the deal against the Cavaliers. Remember the theme of this episode, biggest regular season win for the Grizzlies this entire season. The next reason for that coming up next. But first, I want to give a shout out to Built Bar. This episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat without all the fat and calories, you got to try Built Bar. We just got through the holidays and I'm on the treadmill every other day and I'm trying to get back in the groove, trying to shed some pounds, get a little healthier. Maybe you're like me. You don't want to compromise taste for your snacks and have to think about eating things that aren't enjoyable while you're getting this exercise done. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is pretty tasty. They're so delicious, you won't even think that they're good for you. They're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. They come in flavors that are unbelievable, like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. I'm not sure how they do it, but it's only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. You don't have to wait around to get a box anymore. You can go to Sam's Club. You can go to Walmart in addition to ordering your Built Bars over at Built.com. That's right. Head to Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section. Get a box of Built Bars, cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puffs. That's where they are at Walmart. Or if you're close to a Sam's Club, you can run in and get a 13-bar box of brownie batter or churro. Make sure you're checking out Built Bar. You can thank me later. We're talking Dylan Brooks, Stephen Adams, and DeMichael Cole, my co-host, being right. Here next on Locked On Grizzlies. Stay locked in. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and all our wonderful guests to Locked On Grizzlies. I am Joe Mullinax flying solo on this episode to Michael getting ready for his trip out to the West Coast to follow the Grizzlies on their upcoming West Coast swing. We'll talk more about that in our next episode of Locked On Grizzlies. But we are continuing to rehash and remember and enjoy. What is, in my opinion, and I'm the one hosting the show this time around, so I'm able to plant my flag firmly, the best regular season win of the season for the Grizzlies. And again, you're sitting there saying the Bucks and the Suns and there's other games that they competed and did so well. Life ain't perfect. It wasn't perfect for Jaron Jackson Jr. Like we talked about earlier in the show, and he was able to respond and step up. A couple other guys that things are not perfect for when it comes to their basketball skill sets, Dylan Brooks and Steven Adams. Two starters who, to the credit of DeMichael Cole, every time I get excited about John Morant, Jaron Jackson Jr., or especially Desmond Bain, those are the guys that get the headlines. Those are the guys that are your core three dudes for the next decade. You build around them circa Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, or Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Steph Curry. That's the mentality. Those are your three. But Steven Adams and Dylan Brooks, two flawed players, rose up and made plays when the team needed them most. How is Dylan Brooks flawed? Offensively, not the best game for DB. Four out of 12 shooting, 0 for 5 from 3, did not make a single three-point shot, not a single assist in this game. That's been a point of contention in the conversation about Dylan Brooks's game. If he's not going to have it offensively, is he going to be able to prioritize creating for others? And he's having a good season in that way. He's showing improvement in that area in terms of assists and being a secondary facilitator because he is one of the few Grizzlies that can create his own shot off the dribble. No assists in this game. Not a good thing. Two, uh, Two turnovers in this game. Only three rebounds. So offensively, not his best effort. But as he has said, and as DeMichael and I have talked about, you live with the flaws to get the Dylan Brooks that finished the game for Memphis, blocking that Darius Garland three. You want him on that wall. I'm dating myself a little bit. (laughs) Shout out Jack Nicholson. You want him on that wall. Few good men. Tom Cruise. The idea of needing a guy that is like that on your team, that is willing to step up. And in that last play of the game, last series of the game, last two minutes, say, I'm defending the best guy. It's my job, my responsibility. Not to say that Desmond Bain or John Morant would shy away from that, but Dylan Brooks, it is embroiled in his DNA. He wants that moment. That's where he shows his value, and he most certainly did that against Darius Garland. We talked about earlier. If Jaron Jackson Jr. fouls out, maybe he's more willing 
to try to attack the rim. But he knew that that was going to be challenging in that moment, and he had to get a shot off. Maybe made him a little more predictable. Dylan is a student of the game. Maybe he knew how he was going to rise up for the shot. Maybe he understood the timing of it all. Dylan gets it defensively. And because of his block, the game is over. Grizzlies win. Pop the streamers. But before that, before Dylan's impressive defensive play, his block on Darius Garland, Stephen Adams gets the game-winning bucket. It's on a follow-up on an offensive rebound, continuing to do what Stephen Adams does. And I've said it a time or 12, the fact that he's elite at being big, he's really good at just being a large human being, an excellent screener, a great rebounder, 10 rebounds in this game, another double-double for Stephen Adams, five of those rebounds being offensive, and the most important rebound being the one that helped him get that put-back bucket to win the game. Six for eight from the field. Not a single three-pointer attempted, and he may never attempt a three-point shot in an NBA game. That's his flaw. He doesn't really match what the modern idea of an NBA player is, at least an NBA big. But neither does Jared Allen, really. He didn't take any threes, and Jared Allen had a strong game. What Steven Adams is able to do is use his size and physicality and aggression and be able to apply it in a way that helps Memphis win on both sides of the floor. And he understands where he's supposed to be. He gets his job. He's not looking to be something more than what Memphis needs him to be. That's one of the great gifts of having Adams here. It allows for Jaron and Desmond and Jaw to explore their offensive skill sets to continue to be focal points of scheme and sets. While Steven Adams still contributes to winning basketball. And there's no denying he contributed to winning basketball against the Cleveland Cavaliers. It was a solid game for Steven and Dylan, even though the numbers, especially in the case of Dylan Brooks, don't necessarily back it up. Their importance is significant. And it's one of the main reasons that I am not in favor of a major trade this time around, which is sacrilege for those of you that have followed my work. I'm, I love trades. I've been itching day and night to get on the armchair GM train again and go over to the trade machine and make the Memphis Grizzlies better. But aside from a small deal, the idea of John Conchar for, uh, for you know, some wing that could maybe contribute, a younger wing that maybe fits the frame of what Memphis wants to be a little bit better. That was floated on Twitter, I saw. Cam from The Outsiders, used to do The Outsiders podcast with Anthony Sane in Memphis, again, dating myself. I want to give kudos to him for that idea. Something like that, maybe. Maybe. But even that, I think that they are going to stand pat. They haven't made a trade in the regular season in three years. And I certainly don't think that they're going to make any sort of deal that impacts that starting five. I don't see it. And the reason I don't see it is because a lot of what you saw against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Desmond Bain had a great offensive game. Looked awesome from three. John Morant picked it up in the second half. When the team needed him, he stood up and showed out. Same thing with Jaron Jackson Jr. We talked about it a moment ago. But John Morant, Stephen Adams, or excuse me, John Morant, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., they can't do it alone in that starting lineup. What makes the Grizzlies in the midst of potentially a franchise best winning record or winning streak, which is what is possible for them going into the LA Lakers game on Friday night. If the Grizzlies win that game, they will hold the record for the longest win streak in Grizzlies franchise history. Those are the stakes. And that doesn't happen without Dylan Brooks and Steven Adams. And we are just now seeing enough of that starting five to get excited about what they're capable of. It was hypothetical to start the year, if you remember correctly, because they weren't able to be on the floor. There was injuries. Whether it was Jaron Jackson Jr. to start the season, Desmond Bain as soon as Jaron got back. But those five, that starting five, John Morant, Desmond Bain, Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr., and Steven Adams, they complement each other well. They are wonderful in terms of their niche talents that they bring to the lineups. And again, that starting five, 92nd percentile in the NBA at this stage, plus 21.6. 
and 194 possessions played. And that is before the Cleveland game. I'm sure that number is going to go maybe up a little bit. Again, they didn't have the best plus minus night as a group. They are extremely impressive when they're on the floor together. And that is the group that is going to take you as far as you want to go in the Western Conference. You need to continue to keep those guys together. Maybe you reinforce the reserves, but I think Dylan and Steven have shown for at least this season, especially with Dylan's free agency coming up, they deserve to stay. This episode of Lockdown Grizzlies is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You would have known that the Grizzlies were favored going into the game. If you had gone to BetOnline.net against Cleveland, you would have known that if if you took Cleveland to lose by one, um, or to, if you took Cleveland with the spread, uh, Cleveland would have covered, right? Cleveland had a very impressive showing. So lots of good information there at BetOnline.net analysis, all the ways to get prepared for any game, whether it's basketball, pro, college, the NFL playoffs, literally everything they've got over at BetOnline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They are the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. We're going to finish out this episode of Lockdown Grizzlies talking about other ways that this game was, in my opinion, again, the most impressive victory of the season for Memphis. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Lockdown Grizzlies. I am your host, Joe Mullinax, for this episode, Flying Solo, to Michael Cole preparing for his five-game roadie. He's going out with the Grizzlies, uh, covering as part of the uh, commercial appeals coverage of this upcoming uh, stretch of games for Memphis. So that's going to be a lot of fun for DeMichael. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have him on Friday's show. And we can kind of talk through some of my hot takes from this episode. We can preview that five-game road trip, starting with the Los Angeles Lakers. doesn't get much bigger than that, at least in terms of market on uh, ESPN, no less. So that'll be an interesting game. My takeaway from this episode has been the idea that this is the most impressive win of the Grizzlies season. Okay. First uh, part of the show, we talked about Jaron Jackson Jr., how amazing he was to be able to stay in the game, historically having issues when he had foul trouble, was able to show growth, show development, verticality, using his body well. That's a major step in the right direction. Another great step in the right direction is the idea of Adams and Brooks, Stephen Adams, Dylan Brooks being major contributors late to a team that's going to need them desperately if they are going to compete without a trade in the Western Conference. That leads me to the other reason that this was an impressive win. The Cleveland Cavaliers scored 30 points or more in three straight quarters, the first, second, and third. And in the third quarter, Cleveland, their best quarter, they were able to match their offensive output with defensive intensity. The Memphis Grizzlies only scored 21 points in the third frame. They had scored 31 and 37 in the prior two, 68 total points in the first half for the Grizzlies. So what changes in that third quarter? Cleveland is able to find a way to play their pace, to play their style. Cleveland slows down the game. They're not getting turned over as much as they did in the first half. They're not allowing John Morans and company to get out and run, which is something that the Grizzlies love to do in this transition age of basketball. They're one of the better teams to this day in the NBA at that transition type of offense. Where does Memphis still struggle in the half court? Cleveland was able to get them into that type of style of game in that third quarter, and they made Memphis more constricted. Cleveland is a very good defensive team, as we talked about on the last episode of Lockdown Grizzlies. Memphis going into the game, number one. Cleveland was number two defensively. So the Cavaliers know how to defend, and losing Donovan Mitchell doesn't necessarily hurt them in that manner. They're still a very good defensive team without Mitchell in the fold. The Grizzlies found a way to respond, to adjust, to make key plays when they had to in the fourth quarter coming out of a challenging third where they were punched in the mouth a little bit. And as we approach the playoffs, we're more than halfway through the regular season of the NBA. I think it's fair to say the Grizzlies will be a playoff team. You hope that they'll hang around that first or second seed. They're once again tied with Denver going into Thursday's slate of games for the number one seed in the Western Conference. Denver has the tiebreaker at this time. And you would think that those two teams are going to be playoff teams. Where the seedings happen, we'll let that play out. 
But my biggest overall team takeaway is they played a good team in Cleveland with a good coaching staff. J.B. Bickerstaff has proven that the cards that he was dealt in Memphis were not indicative of who he was as a coach. And we knew that. I knew that. I said at the time I hoped J.B. would get another job in a better situation, and it's exactly what's played out for him, and I'm genuinely happy for him. He was a good. He is a good coach. He just wasn't – he's a victim of circumstance where the Grizzlies were at that time. Taylor Jenkins is a good coach too. And the Grizzlies were able to – pick themselves up after having a 17 or 19 point lead and losing it. Cleveland came back. They took the lead, especially in that fourth quarter. They found ways to still take the lead. They were up by three with about a minute left. Cleveland was the Grizzlies bucked up, stood up, bowed their necks, puffed out their chests, Whatever phrasing you want to use, they punched back. That matters a ton. Because they're about to enter a stretch of games where they're going to be on the road in places like Golden State, like Los Angeles. And I know folks like to make fun of the Lakers, but LeBron James is having one of the best seasons of his career, comparably, especially when you consider it's his 20th season in the NBA. And they're going out to L.A. They are going into places where they are going to have challenges. Sacramento, Minnesota is playing better basketball. Every night is going to be similar to what the Cleveland Cavaliers are capable of. How do you respond when things are not going well? We talked about Jaron doing a great job of it. Dylan Brooks and Steven Adams, arguably the two veteran players in the rotation now for Memphis, making the key plays to win the game. But as a team. John Morant going down with neck and back tightness, coming back in the game. Desmond Bain making big shot after big shot when the Grizzlies needed him to be that offensive weapon. Santi Aldama making big plays off the dribble, giving meaningful minutes. 20 minutes, 6 of 8 shooting for Santi Aldama. 6 of 8. That is so impressive. Brandon Clark, strong performance, 7.7 rebounds, being aggressive, getting to the rim. The Grizzlies bench was a key piece of this win, too. And I wrote about over at my Substack how Zaire Williams was ready for a larger role. Only 17 minutes in this one. Wasn't his most productive game. But he is somebody that they're depending on to try to see if they can do this as they are currently constructed. Or do they need to go make a move to make themselves more viable for a potential championship run? I think they think they've got what they need. And to be honest with you, games like this reinforce that mentality. Because even though the half-court offense struggled, and they most certainly did, don't get me wrong, that is the major weakness of the Memphis Grizzlies, is how are they going to score when teams are able to slow them down and get them out of rhythm like the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Cavs are not the only squad that's going to be able to do that to Memphis. So what comes next when the other two drops? Schematically, they got to figure that out. That is the glaring weakness in their game is their half-court offensive looks. They're not efficient enough in that area. They're just not. But they're so strong defensively, and they're so strong when they're able to get out and transition. They're able to mask it for now as they try to figure out, can they get further internal development in that way, or do they need to go outside? To this point, in the last several years, they have made the conscious choice to prioritize internal development. And it's not just physical, it's mental as well. The main reason for me why the Cleveland game was the most impressive one is that mental toughness that you saw displayed. Time and again, Memphis could have laid down. They had all the momentum going into the game. Cleveland had to shock their system a little bit without Donovan Mitchell being able to do what they did, coming back, storming back. The Cavs deserve all the credit in the world for that. The Grizzlies pick themselves up, dust themselves off, find a way to win. It's not always going to be blowouts. It's not always going to be sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes it's going to be a back alley brawl. And that's exactly what transpired in Memphis between the Grizzlies and the Cavaliers on Wednesday night. Cleveland got the Grizzlies flustered. They knocked them to the mat, but Memphis was able to get back up and do what it took to win that game. 
And that more than anything gives me the hope and the faith that this group as constructed can find a way to get to the NBA finals. Could a trade make them better in terms of that half court offense? Absolutely. They have the resources. They have the salary matching contracts. They could do it. But they're a pretty darn good basketball team as constructed. And I think that the extended window being wide open over the next several years is what this team is focused on, for better or worse. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that here on Lockdown Grizzlies moving forward. Thank you for making Lockdown Grizzlies your first listen today. Now go make your second listen game to game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only the Locked On Network can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. The next time that we're back together here on Locked On Grizzlies, we'll be previewing that five-game West Coast swing that my co-host, Michael Cole, with a commercial appeal, will be out following the Grizzlies on. It's going to be a very telling opportunity for Memphis. Obviously, Cleveland, that's in the past now. It's in the rear view. You're on to L.A. You're on to multiple West Coast games and putting yourself in a position to be able to not just build upon a winning streak. It Probability would suggest this winning streak will end on this road trip. I hope not. But if it does, again, much like they had to do against Cleveland, how do you respond? That response is going to be fascinating to watch as we continue to see the Grizzlies under this contender banner thrive. Can they maintain? To this point, they have. And I think that this road trip will be another terrific test of just who the Grizzlies are with that championship idea becoming more and more prevalent in the minds, not just of national media, but those that follow the Grizzlies as well. Make sure you're liking, commenting, subscribing over at our YouTube page. Make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Continue to make Lockdown Grizzlies part of your Memphis Grizzlies NBA experience each and every day. I appreciate it. I know DeMichael does as well. What a win. Be proud of your Memphis Grizzlies, Grizzlies fans. That was a playoff atmosphere game that Memphis didn't have their best, and they found a way to win. Kudos to Cleveland. Again, very impressive showing from the Cavaliers. They're for real in the East. The Grizzlies are for real, too. Until next time, I'm Joe Molinak. Stay locked in, folks. This is Locked on Grizzlies.